Hello everyone, this is Afira Firdos. I am an independent analyst based in Islamabad. Today I am here with a special podcast with Professor Firoz Hassan Khan. Firoz Hassan Khan is a research professor at Naval Postgraduate School, Monterey, California. He has served as director in Pakistan's Strategic Plans Division. He is also the author of Eating Grass, The Making of a Nuclear Bomb. Today we are going to discuss his recently published book, Subcontinent Adrift, Strategic Futures of South Asia. Thank you so much, sir, for taking out time for this podcast. This is real honor for me to host you. No, first of all, thank you very much for taking all the time to come here and introduce the book. And thank you for your very kind introduction. Thank you, sir. So before we go to the book discussion, I want to ask a few things. Um, so normally, uh, here there are studies in this way, like your life. Like you are a decorated military officer. You uh, serve for probably two, more than two, years. 30 years, three decades in Pakistan Army. And then becoming a um, renowned ac academic writer and now publishing two books, uh, going to Woodrow Wilson Center, uh, Stanford University, John Hopkins, and now NPS. So how do you look at that journey? Was that planned or is it a coincidence? Well, the answer is yes and no, both, but it, it may be a longer answer to give. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, um, there's no uniqueness about a person like me, and there should not be any uniqueness about someone like me. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been a long 200 years tradition because Pakistan Army and Indian Army, for that matter, is an offshoot of the British Indian military. And that uh, military had a strong tradition of producing something called soldier scholar. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and this goes back to hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. So. Indian Pakistani militaries were very proud, uh, you know, sort of the, to producing those kind of mm. thinking uh, officers uh, in their in their realm. You mm -hmm. know. Yeah. So you know, and uh, when I got commissioned, you know, I was under the shadow of such officers. I can take a few names like Aga Ibrahim Akram. I'm a mm -hmm. second lieutenant. He's the general officer commanding, General E H Dar, and then later on, General K M Arif Khalid bin Mudarif, mm -hmm. General Aslam Beg, even General Jangi Karam. But you can see the 20th century. Uh, ending the 20th century, we had army chiefs and all who were all writers, book writers. Mm -hmm. Even General Parvez Musharraf wrote a book till 2005 mm -hmm. and 6. Mm -hmm. You see the tradition that you know there was this uh, encouragement of intellectualism to be growing, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the country and encouraging uh, officers mm -hmm. to become the one. So uh, the resultantly, what happened was that you know, I mean, this is the product that you become. At one stage, at the end of uh, the 80s. It was so that uh, we were sent abroad to top universities in the world to get educated. Yeah. And I'm the product of one of that, uh, mm. you know, Brigadier Reem Saleh and many others of my colleagues were yeah. one. And that's where we became the kind of officers that we became. My being in settlement in the US, like 30 years in the military and then now 20 years in the academic world, um, was a result of peculiar set of circumstances uh, that began at the beginning of the century. And uh, I was at Stanford University as a visiting fellow in 2001, mm -hmm. before 9-11. And then there were a series of events that happened 9-11. Yes. And then India-Pakistan crisis, uh, you know, uh, 2001 and two, and the AQ Han crisis. Mm -hmm. So these three crises, back to back to back with the years, I was at that time and, and Naval Postgraduate School asked me to uh, come and teach there as a visiting professor. Mm -hmm. And that's how the, so that was, uh, also the peak of American Pakistan relation, the renewed one. And so the Pakistan government was interested that, you know, somebody should be there to teach. And that's mm. what I did. Mm. And the US government was interested because of all these issues because they did not understand the complexity of this issue. So my scholarly bent from my younger days and my education at Johns Hopkins mm. combined together with a new life and my military life was ending anyway at that stage. So that was the cusp of my military career ending and the beginning of a new one with most uh, officers of my kind would probably aspire to become but circumstances brought me there mm. and it was up to me to sort of then produce what mm. it, uh, what, what has become what you just introduced you know, so. yeah so, so that's you, my life you know so yeah. you brought um, brought up three uh, crises like 2001 uh, September 11 ad attack then Pakistan India um, military standoff and then AQ Khan 2004 yeah. Yeah. 
So how how was that a challenge? You were already in in the US and uh, you were planning to settle down. So how was that a challenge? Uh, being a Pakistani f from a, a military background and then hap three uh, consecutive things happening. How yeah. was that a challenge? So first of all, I was not planning to settle down. <laughs> That's okay. the most okay. important thing. I was I was actually coming back. Okay. When all this okay. happened, you know, and so mm -hmm. I had to really put it to the Pakistan government and the U.S. government. They had to decide, with, you know, mm -hmm. and it was thought that, you know, I'm, because of my unique position at the time, mm -hmm. it was so much encouragement to do so. Mm -hmm. But it was a challenging time more for Pakistan, actually, mm -hmm. and also for the U.S.-Pakistan relations in, in many ways. Because, you know, we had a question about nuclear proliferation concerns to mm -hmm. the Khan. Mm -hmm. uh, the st nuclear st stability, a two nuclear armed power in the kind of standoff. Yeah. And 9-11 brought a new sort of a twist to uh, terror and counterterrorism, and that related to the security and not just the state. And so everything became intertwined. And the crosshair of the international security was right here in the region of mm -hmm. India, Pakistan and Afghanistan. Yeah. So obviously anybody like me to be there, uh, I would be speaking at every forum hmm. and that was the moment that, you know, even, even ordinary sort of explanation about things would appear to the American audience uh, to be something that they did not know well. Hmm. So hmm. you became center of the world hmm. because of the circumstances and that is how, that's what I became and so that hmm. I was there for one year uh, on a teaching assignment that one year is now 20 years. Yes. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, you know, in an academic scholarly world, mm -hmm. it's a very different world from the military world. Mm -hmm. But what I, had I not been as a young officer, gone to get trained in Johns Hopkins and other university, mm -hmm. I could not have developed the different tools of analysis, which is more in the scholarly world. Mm -hmm. And the military tool of analysis are slightly different than the academic world. Exactly. So yeah. I became a sort of a unique in that sense that I could use the one loaf of the military and you yeah. know have interface with the other one mm -hmm. to produce which was which became more unique. So my writing style is neither purely academic, which the academic world can easily understand, but it can possibly also be understood by the military world because I do bring that like logic of a mm -hmm. military way of analysis together. So it mm -hmm. becomes sort of a hybrid sort of a writing yeah, style, yeah, yeah. which uh, was sort of more unique in, in that part of the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, Eating Grass is your first book, yes. and you mentioned in this manuscript, second book, that you started this manuscript first, and then paused and went to Eating Grass. So, why was that important that you thought I should write that first? Yeah. So, it's interesting that subcontinent adrift actually began uh, before Eating Grass, mm -hmm. and that it's very interesting. It it is interesting for people to understand why it became uh, not just this book, but going back to the time. Hmm. So at the turn of the century, uh, 2001, uh, the world was, uh, like I said, before 9-11 happened, uh, the concern was that there are two nuclear armed power hmm. emerged in Southern Asia. <laughs> yeah. What does that mean? Because you have to understand the world as it was at the time, hmm. uh, that the world has not seen a regional security conundrum of this kind of two nuclear hmm. power with a yeah. long, deep history of uh, you know Conflict, rivalry yeah. now becoming nuclear. What will become of that? So Stanford University actually produced a, a sort of a conference. That was my first uh, exposure to international scholarship. Mm. And that was a conference called South Asia in 2020. Mm. Now, meaning that, you know, what would India, Pakistan look like 20 years from now? Mm. And one school of thought was actually stemming, which was a cautiously, cautiously optimistic school of thought that India, Pakistan are rational actors, you know, I mean, with nuclear weapons in the game, there is a forlorn hope that there will be stability, peace, mm. and event, eventual conflict resolution, or a sort of South Asian detente on modest Vivendi mm -hmm. between the two countries. Mm -hmm. And that was stemming essentially from Lahore Agreement of 99, which happened okay. within one year. Yeah. But then there was an opposing trend, Kargil uh, conflict, because, and that was brought a more skeptic sort of a stream of thinking mm -hmm. that they're going to be having crisis after crisis and they're going to be the, the, the problems between the two is so deep rooted and therefore they, it's going to spike through crisis and you know bring uh, the nuclear brinkmanship will continue to mm -hmm. go on and on. Mm -hmm. and so that school of thought was there. Now Professor Steve Cohen, Tracy Schaeffer, Scott Schaeffer, many others were on that skeptical scheme of thing mm -hmm. and then there were others like me who were more on the optimistic side because 
we were so faithful about strategic restraints, mm. uh, Lahore Memorandum of Understanding that, you know, this is the pathway, this is the goal. So these two futures were thought that this could be a bad one or a good one. From that conference, okay. uh, it started. So I was a Brookings Fellow at some point, and Steve Cohen is the one who actually asked me that, you know, you should be writing about the broader strategic future of the region rather than a very narrow, because I had a chapter in that conference okay. yeah. and that was eventually uh, actually a, a edited volume called South Asia in 2020. Okay. In fact that was my first ever paper outside after retirement mm -hmm. in the scholarly world uh, but that was just a chapter called Nuclear Future but this was a much bigger one. Mm -hmm. uh, but why you your question was what happened uh, uh, you know eating grass the genesis of eating grass. Yeah. I think it, it is very important because again we go back. Uh, because the AQ Khan controversy was such a huge event at that time that exactly. even, and it, it's happening under the shadow of 9-11, I mean, mm -hmm. look, the overarching. Mm -hmm. India-Pakistan um, standoff was kind of dissipating at the time. Mm -hmm. So it was a proliferation concern as to what does this mean. And I was at the NPS at the time and it was uh, my idea that actually we should approach the Pakistan government and say that, look, and it was a fear that if we do not bring out a comprehensive story of Pakistan nuclear history and program. Mm -hmm. the Pakistani nuclear program will always be synonymous to AQ Khan network. Yeah. That is the story of Pakistan nuclear program and you know all sorts of negativity associated. Mm -hmm. So I said no, there's just there's a different story to it. The state's motivation. Mm -hmm. And uh, that big book becomes more unique in many ways, not because I'm the author but because uh, the, the the circumstances in which it was mm. written and the, and the reason why book came become more important uh, for because we want to bring out the story yeah so uh, and it is even more unique in the sense that this was unprecedented uh, support from mm. uh, SPD particularly General Kidwai I'm so grateful and the atmosphere of writing and scholarship like General Musharraf's environment so the state of Pakistan was so keen to let me, you know, access interviews, hmm. briefings. Hmm. That's unique because of that. Hmm. And uh, that's probably, I would say, unprecedented. And I'm, I'm not sure whether it's ever going to happen again. And most importantly, it was the voice of those who were actually the, it's the voice, it's their voice. Part it's not the me, it's program. them. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, you're not going to hear again, Sabdada Yaqub interviewed, yes, Aga exactly. Shahi talking, General K. M. Arif talking, yeah. Abdul yeah. Sattar talking, and then, yeah. you know, Tanvir Ahmad Khan. These yeah. people were at the helm of the decision making. Um, and then, uh, like, uh, scientists, you know, like Dr. Ashwak Ahmed, uh, Dr. Samar Mubarak Mand. Yeah. I was not allowed to speak to Akhu Khan because of the controversy, mm -hmm. but his number two, uh, you know. Uh, so, you know, I mean, the, it, it became unique from that standpoint because it was their story weaved into a very simple question. And my scholarly writing essentially is that, you know, you put a very simple, straightforward question mm. because it has to be read by scholars, academics, everyone. Uh, and my question simply was, what is it about the nuclear bomb mm. that you are prepared to make your people eat grass? Yeah. It's apparently that's the simple. Why is it so important? Yeah. I mean, you're saying we'll eat grass and build the bomb. Why? I mean, why would you make your people eat grass? Mm -hmm. So, and then I tried to answer in 400 pages yeah. why, why it is important. Coming to your book, a uh, recent book, um, Subcontinent Adrift, Strategic Futures of South Asia. Uh, you discussed the uh, Stanford uh, conference and the idea came from that conference. And you discussed two positions. Uh, 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 one that you were uh, in favor of and the other one, um, Professor Stephen Kuhn. There was another third position as well where, um, and you mentioned in this book that most of the participants were of the view that U.S. would play a stabilizing role in the region. So now, 20 years after that conference, after that discussion, how do you see the role of U.S. in this region, in uh, in um, case of uh, different crises and conflicts between India and Pakistan. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a very interesting question because you know if we have in those two pathways, mm -hmm. an optimistic pathway and leading to conflict resolution, and then a pathway that is crisis-ridden, yeah, yeah. leading to major wars. Mm -hmm. 
uh, what's the role, Wh which country, in the, because it's an international conference, which country is going to be the stabilizer mm. or the offshore balancer in this whole, mm. Uh, mm. and obviously it was thought that uh, no other country other than U.S. can have that mm. influence. Mm. And I still think that even today, that is still the case because if you look at great power competition, you know, in other words, the, there's no way the Chinese can become a stabilizer because India considers yeah. that to be. Yeah. And in some sense, even Pakistan does not fully trust the U.S. the way it, it had at the time, mm -hmm. uh, even now. But then there's no other alternative, you know, at the same time. So uh, I still believe that is the case. But I'll, I'll, I'll try to answer you in a very interesting way. So both pathways, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. had a role and it did play a role in all crises that happened Mm -hmm. from that period, you know, you know all the crises, so mm -hmm. Mumbai and Uri and so on. There was always behind the scenes U.S. that did play a role. Uh, somebody, somebody's going to write in details as to mm -hmm. what those roles were. Uh, but here is something very different that U.S. could have played a better role mm -hmm. in pushing India and Pakistan towards a conflict resolution part. Yeah. It, it left the United States, left India and Pakistan on their own devices to reach Detente mm. and modest Mubandi and, and conflict. Yeah, it yeah. it played, did not play any catalyst role and still is not playing any role in mm. bringing conflict to a resolution. It is mm. not pressurizing India and Pakistan mm. that you know, that pathway is the one to go. So it's more like a crisis manager mm. and yes, not a conflict exactly. res right. resolver. Resolver, yes. And I think that's, I, I'm critical of the US role in the region that mm. it doesn't play a proactive role there. Mm. It only becomes proactive because it is concerned about that things may escalate and go all right. Which means that US is only concerned that this two nuclear armed countries, two allied countries mm. don't go into the conflict and as long as the conflict is contained, it's none of my business to try to resolve the conflict. Mm. Mm. I don't think that that answers the problem that you know that you leave it for another crisis to happen Mm. And, and that's exactly what has happened. It's crisis after crisis. And one other thing that is happening is, and the U.S. is well aware, or pro probably not aware, but it's our job as scholars to indicate um, that each country, India and Pakistan, take a different lesson from each crisis. Mm -hmm. They draw different lessons from each crisis. Yes. There's no consensus about each understanding of each other's doctrine. Yeah. There's a symmetry. There's no... And then when you, the more you take lessons away, uh, from each other, you create a standing ground, a staging ground for the next crisis to happen. Yeah. And that has gone from Kargil down to Palwama Balako. Exactly. This is my observation and we can discuss more and in subcontinent adrift, all of these things come out. Yeah, exactly. So you speak of cognitive biases in this book, in this um, um, subcontinent adrift. So how are they playing a role in that drifting subcontinent apart. Yeah, so the second chapter of the book talks about the drift and I'm really going into, because if you have a title drift, you have to explain mm. what are you talking yeah, about. Exactly. What is the drift? Mm. So it goes into that drift part mm. and that the drift is not simply as put across that, okay, uh, Kashmir is the problem, Sir Creek is the problem, mm. Sayachin, you mm. know. These problems are unresolved issues from the partition, got more complex as we period. And I'm arguing that it's not that solution to these problems cannot be easily found. Everybody knows solution to this problem. Yeah. India and Pakistan have been engaged so many times and both sides know what each other want and both sides know what is the maximalist position of both countries and conflicts are never resolved by sticking to your maximalist position. Yeah. It's always through yeah. a negotiating process that you come down to a sort of a middle ground. That's called modus vivendi, you know, eventually. Mm -hmm. And that's what we were hoping the, the, uh, the first pathway. Um, essentially, that, you know, is not uh, happening, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, in the sense, you know. So, uh, I'm losing my train of thought, you know, here. Uh, we but, uh, can yeah. come back to cogn yeah. cognitive biases. So, uh, sorry, I'm sorry. I'm so unresolved problem. I'm, I apologize, you know. So, uh, <clears throat> I determined that it is actually it's the deep the deepening of the the problem is the cognitive biases mm. that you have actually made enemy mirror images of each other mm. that you have harped upon so much about how we are different from each other mm. than what we were common about. Yeah, you cannot deny the fact that this subcontinent existed together for thousands of years, yeah. and that the idea that Muslims is a separate nation and Hindu whatever. 
No, I'm not getting into that because so much has been written about it. But once you got what you wanted, you got a nation state you wanted, both of them got what mm. they wanted, then what explains the, the partition was supposed to resolve the communal problem that had existed. Yeah. Yeah. It was not supposed so if you resolve the problem, then why is it turned into two nation states, non nuclear armed into a mm. sort of a, mm. enduring rivalry between the two? Mm. And I'm saying that it is just the cognitive biases that have been existed, you know, mm. that, you know, just simply by spite, you know. And that whole st uh, thing says that, you know, because of the images that you have created, then you eventually created enclaves in mm. countries. Mm. And those enclaves are so entrenched in, yeah. in, in both countries that leadership and others who want to go for a resolution to the problem, trying to break that, uh, you know, that enclave uh, edifice, if you will, that is created, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it becomes very, very difficult to do so. Mm -hmm. So that prevails upon any ideas. And therefore, you come this close to conflict resolution and you cannot do that, whether it was Agra, whether it was Manmohan Musharraf thing, or even going back to Nehru and uh, Ayub Khan period and prior mm, to that. Mm. At every stage, Bhutto, Indra Gandhi, every stage, there you can keep on taking the pair of leadership between India and Pakistan, who came, who wrote, you have seen, documents are there, you have, uh, you know, sort of a structural arrangements to move forward. Lahore yeah. agreement is one case in point, you know, yeah. you similar with another. You can keep going back, but you do not move forward beyond that mm -hmm. because it's a letter that you can follow, but not the spirit. And then it does not translate into a political settlement of the issue. Mm -hmm. And you mm -hmm. leave it to the military uh, components to continue the mm -hmm. crisis. Mm -hmm. So I am identifying cognitive biases mm -hmm. uh, as the main cause and then those biases eventually, as the book will eventually unfold, mm. uh, gets into, uh, seeps into the doctrine and, and thinking and yeah. then it becomes much yeah. more structured mm. uh, that uh, yeah. you probably have read in the book, so mm. we can discuss more later. Yeah. Yeah. So we are discussing the future of the region. So you yeah. uh, mentioned uh, economic interdependency and connectivity. Do you think economic interdependency and connectivity is the only viable solution bet uh, for peace between India and Pakistan? Maybe not now, maybe 20 or 30 years uh, from now. And another question that can we afford to wait for another 50 years, half a decade to start prosperity in the region? Yeah, so I mean, this is um, something that, that has been debated in many mm. other works mm. and etc. I'm not saying something new about this. Yeah. There has been this theory that, you know, economically, inter democracies and economically interdependent countries mm. do not go to wars mm. and crises. Mm. And I use the word interconnectivity because this is modern, this is 21st century era yeah. of connectivity. And every, uh, the geopolitics of Southern Asia or geopolitics of Asia mm. as a whole, if you will, mm. is all about connectivity, you know, today. Today's great power mm. competition is China is moving out. Uh, connecting those remote areas that were never connected mm. in ways yeah. uh, and yeah. this is modern era so therefore connectivity mm. is the one that you know hitherto inaccessible areas will become accessible uh, and might change the whole life it's not just a china pakistan economic corridor but what essentially does it that central asia and south asia connectivity revival will create different kind of economic incentives for the mm. and, and I think I also mentioned people to people contact and yeah. because the cultural yeah. revival is important. Now this is not unique uh, to the region it is unique to the region in the sense that why would you not have this? Mm. Uh, there are regions in the world where conflicts exist in uh, entire Asia for example mm. uh, but they continue to do some kind of a, this, this connectivity does not go mm. you know. Mm. Uh, you know um, in, in Asia and other countries, they have, you yeah. have problems. You don't make problem to become a, you know, a source of misery for yourself. Mm. It doesn't mm. make any intellectual sense. Yeah. Yeah. So look at China, India, you know, I mean, they have problems, of course, and they don't want to resolve the problem because neither side would agree. But even in the peak period of COVID in 2020, their trade, bilateral trade was over 100 billion. Yes, exactly. You know, the yeah. one example. And what's the trade between India and Pakistan? Because you are now making your own people mm. miserable. Mm. 
So I'm talking about the myopic nature of policy, not just of one country, but actually primarily it's about India. Mm -hmm. That you know, and the book is more about India is the leader in South Asia. So mm. India leads the direction, the future of South Asia in mm. ways. Mm. It's, a, it's the conduct of India, whether India wants to simply dominate mm. or wants to take on the leadership role. Mm. And if India takes a leadership role, these things will matter. But as you read in the book, that that's not quite yeah. what is happening. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Agreed. So this year, Pakistan issued first ever national security policy. And two major facets of that policy are geoeconomics and no camp uh, geopolitics. So wh what is your take on no camp geopolitics? Pakistan has been an, a US ally for past 20 years. The alliance, which was in benefit of both countries, U.S. and Pakistan, but now here is a realization that Pakistan lost more than um, getting benefit from that alliance. What is your take on this? You can always count what the glass is empty, mm. uh, and you can refuse the fact that it was also half full. Mm. So, it's sort of depending on the the, the, the nature of analysis, mm. you do that. Um, so, so let me let me since you. Put the question in terms of uh, uh, no camp and, and current yeah. policy, uh, geoeconomics and all. Uh, intuitively, I'm mentioning that geoeconomics is something that has should have been always been the case mm. in, historically. Mm. Uh, look back into the data when the two countries, India, Pakistan, became independent. Uh, I mentioned about the data about India as well as how how uh, what state of affairs it was the mm. countries two together, and now you got the independence. Uh, 75 years as we this book has come at the cusp of 75 years mm. uh, India had a Hindu rate of growth mm. but Pakistan had spikes of economics yeah. at every stage and what might explain in the 1960s Pakistani economic growth was the US alliance mm. were it not for the US alliance in the 50s 60s every writing of the era was talking about mm. whether this country will even survive or not yeah Right. Mm, mm. So, and at that, and in the mid 60s, as you read in the book, you were about to take off mm, at a stage mm. that no other developing country in the world had at that stage. Mm. And you were really knocking to become a middle power. Mm. So, it's about India's premonition of a great power and Pakistan really being a middle Islamic power mm. was pretty much feasible at the time. Mm. But then, what happened that instead of that economic component that was so prominent in the 60s, mm. Wars and crises, etc., happen, mm. and since then you are bleeding from one crisis into the other. Yeah, and it is the economic component that comes back is also as a result of the crisis that has been supportive, alliance mm. politics. For example, the 1980s, it was the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and the war that asymmetric war raged from here. That's where the aid and etc. came. Yeah, what happened between the 70s? You were going back into the look at the economic growth then. Yeah. Go back to the 1990s, it goes down. Yeah. So the roller coaster of the U.S. Pakistan relation is not the focus of the book. I think we all know that. Yeah. I mean, it yeah. doesn't. Yeah. But then again, in the since you asked the question again, look at the first uh, decade, almost 2007-8, uh, the mm. economic growth again is as a result of uh, a different war yeah. uh, in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah. So, exactly. I, so I am arguing that. That uh, in the chapter of pa assessing Pakistan grand strategy, mm. that the key pillars of Pakistan grand strategy, as we know now, mm. uh, are essentially uh, external alliance, mm. external and mm. then uh, nuclear mm. weapons. You know, these are the two pillars on which mm. you still mm. Uh, mm. rely. So it's not about the no camp policy. Okay. It's about that you can you survive without external alliance mm. Mm. and. If you are so dependent on nuclear weapons, do you understand that nuclear weapons alone is mm. not a panacea for entire security? Mm. If these two things are not there, there is a how do you assess Pakistan's grand strategy you know, yeah. or absence of it? Shall mm. we put it this way? I'm equally critical about India that you have this premonition of great power, and then it goes to India. India is more centric; the chapter is longer mm -hmm. because it really gets into how India will derive the thing. So it's about India, which has been just the opposite. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. mm -hmm. India has been. So if you really, from the very beginning, mm -hmm. India has been uh, non-aligned, mm -hmm. 
Hmm. India has been secular, pluralistic democracy, hmm. hmm. non-aligned India, democracy and autarkic policy you know, from the very beginning. India, yeah, yeah, yeah. Never yeah. And many India continued like that. Hmm. It, compare that to Pakistan, it's just the opposite. Hmm. From rather than being a secular, so non-aligned, it was aligned. Hmm. Secular, it was, you know, Islamic it's Republic Islamic and Republic. states. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, state, not, not a secular country, hmm. you know. And it had that open economy, just the opposite of India. India, yeah. So Pakistan and India went immediately through different pathways hmm. from the very beginning. Hmm. So then what happened? Then things began to change, you know. So you cannot wish as of now suddenly because it, then in Jew economy and camp becomes synonymous in the sense you when, what do you mean by Jew economics Jewish geography part yeah. economic part can only come as you might probably heard in one of the recent seminars that you know unless you have that economic infrastructure by simply saying Jew economic doesn't make sense it's yeah. a it's a correct idea it's a yeah. correct approach but it's going to take long exactly you, you don't raise people's expectations suddenly by saying these very catchy mm -hmm. words, mm -hmm. but you've got to be more realistic. It, it, is, it is the right pathway. Mm -hmm. So many critics, many scholars essentially talk about that this Wadi Pakistan geographical significance of Pakistan, mm -hmm. we call it Jew strategic significance, yeah. Jew economic significance. End of the matter is the geography. It is yeah. the geographic significance that you are at the crossroads of Central and South and yeah. landlocked Asia to yeah. the sea. Yeah. That Anybody can see the geography yeah. has always existed. There's nothing new about geography. Yeah. You've been there. And so that's where you are there. And if you, you remember the book that what this Pakistan geography does, mm. it, it blocks India's direct access to Central Asia, Central Asia, to yeah. the West, yeah. and forces India to be on the maritime only. So what have you used with this significance of geography? Mm -hmm. uh, many scholars have said that Pakistan has used this geography for security purposes, jumping off point. Hmm. For Afghanistan, whether to yeah. defeat Soviet Union hmm. or hmm. defeat counter terror, uh, you know, or you have used the same northern part, northern half of the triangular Pakistan to wage Kashmir, uh, liberate Kashmir hmm. and all. Hmm. The southern part of Pakistan, below Chindistan, that is the part that actually opens up to the sea. Yeah. And for yeah. the first uh, 50, 70 years, you have not been able to utilize that. See, the coastline hmm. development is a new phenomena. Exactly. Yeah. You're not looking outwardly from that sense. Hmm. If you're truly looking at economic sense, you should be seeing that we are an outlet to the landlocked world, which is now happening. And I don't mean to be cynical, and that is not happening because China realized that you are ge more geographically significant. Yeah. Yeah. It was China that thought hmm. of Karakram Highway in the 60s and access hmm. to that, and that was as far back. It hmm. didn't happen overnight. Were you really thinking about that? So uh, I'm just making this case. So yeah. you, in that sense also, you are still dependent on external alliance. Mm. You're not camp follower. Yeah. You're still yeah. dependent. So I think as the debate uh, is there that, you know, I mean, uh, Pakistan-China relation has to be there for these for many geographical neighborly and this historical mm -hmm. reasons now. But simultaneously, Pakistan, United States or U.S. relation with South Asia as a whole mm. is, is going to be a variable that you cannot deny. So U.S. will remain the most important political, economic, military, and technological power for the foreseeable future. That, That's really interesting. Yeah. Yes, that is irreplaceable, mm. no matter which alliance balancing you do. Yeah. So, but because you are, you are thinking in terms of making your future in the economic future, mm. then the best course for you is, it's a no-camp policy, is a good policy actually. Mm. You don't want to get into alliance politics. Mm. but you should not deny the fact that you are, you are externally reliant on the country. Yeah. Yeah. Even economic conditions as we speak here and exactly, here. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you're dependent on IMF. Mm -hmm. You're depending on not being uh, in, on a blacklist of financial action task yeah. force. You are still a major non-NATO ally with mm -hmm. the United States. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you still have maximum exports to the US and the European countries. Mm -hmm. Are these not facts? Mm -hmm. So between facts and desire, you know, it's not it's not a good thing to sort of not let the people know what it is you know mm -hmm. so you you know it's 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 balancing you can be classical balancing between us and china you were at a position you brought us and china together you can still be there but that was a stronger pakistan this is much weaker is mm -hmm. the external alliance you're dependent on them let's yeah. face it yeah. so and 
The other part is the nuclear weapons part, where the strategy revolves around that. So and that's a different debate. Yeah. Yeah. So my next question is about that. You discussed yeah. Pakistan and India taking different paths, and you also uh, have two chapters in this on Pakistan and India's grand strategies. Yeah. So what puzzled you analyzing Pakistan and India's grand strategies? Do you think there are s any straight answers to Pakistan's India problem and India's Pakistan problem? So that's a, you <laughs> posed the question that I did in the book. So <laughs> that means you've really read it. Huh? <laughs> yes, so there's a India. Pa <laughs> India has a Pakistan problem mm. and Pakistan has an India problem. Yeah. Now the big question is now, uh, as things have evolved, that um, for Pakistan, India is the problem. Hmm. For India, Pakistan actually is a problem. One of but the way is one of the problems. Is a yeah. problem. Yeah. But the way India behaves is as if it is the problem hmm. for hmm. 75 years. It, it talks about premolution or glory and going into great power competition hmm. and all. Hmm. India has multiple problems now. Things have moved in the 21st hmm. century. Uh, but if uh, so it's, the book is more about India that, you know, if we, and many Indian authors, they are quoted in that, how is India tried to resolve its Pakistan problem? Hmm. And why India has consistently failed yeah. the Pakistan problem? And I'll come to the question as to how the, it was coined and how the book started in that way. But in the case of Pakistan, it talks about no camp, all this, but for Pakistan, it is, everything is India. Mm -hmm. It is such an existential threat. And that's just a fact. I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not being cynical about mm -hmm. Pakistan. I think that's just a fact. Yeah. But I think that even the Pakistan doesn't know how to have an India strategy. Mm. So I'm saying it's not a grand strategy. It's the failure of or absence of a grand strategies of the two countries. Mm. As to on how both sides. On both sides, actually. Mm. So, but I do analyze uh, the, the whole. Intuitively, that's what mm. I'm sort of saying that. So in India's case, I said, you know, and many authors have written and I've quoted all, George Tenem began in the early 90s. What about India now? The Cold War has ended in the early 90s. So, and Steve Cohen and many others thought that India still moved those concentric Artha Shastra, mm -hmm. still those mandala circles. So there is one core India, let's talk it inside India. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. the periphery is India's neighbors, South Asia yeah. call it. In, yeah. But China is also a neighbor and Pakistan is also a neighbor. And then the world, the third circle, the world. Mm. So India's strategy is more about competing at the world level, ignoring what's happening inside India, and ignoring what's happening to its domestic, uh, to the neighbor's policy, and trying to become the big guy, on the yeah. bigger power. Yeah. Uh, so I'm arguing that if you don't solve the problem at your home, mm. and in your backyard, in your neighborhood, how can you become a great power out there because this is going to drag you in. Exactly. Yeah. And this is not my school of thought. This is the school of thought that has existed in India. So there were two streams of thought that existed in India's grand strategy. One was called Indira Gandhi school of thought, mm -hmm. sort of indicating that, you know, deal with the world, these people will come to terms that India is ordained to rise anyway. Mm -hmm. So don't deal with these guys. You know, they, they'll come to terms. Then this was a reversal of Gujral, I.K. Gujral, called yeah. the Gujral Doctrine, saying, look, I mean, let's resolve the problem from within, get the India's neighborhood, so that the neighbors have a stake in the rise of India. Hmm. And rather than India's rise is feared by India's neighbor, hmm. they should have a stake in India's rise. Yeah. Yeah. And we thought that intellectually that was a much more pragmatic approach because that would have meant conflict resolution of sorts and then, you know, then, then that connectivity, people to people contact, culture, and all those things that we mm. talked about, interdependency, mm. will take a natural course. But the manner in which India conducted its external policy became exactly the opposite of what India had hoped for. Every small or big number of India continues to have complained about non-resolution of conflict with India. Mm. Mm. In, and India wanted its dominance or sort of its hegemonic zone of influence in the South Asian, which is openly India has been mm. saying, and, mm. and fearing external powers influence onto India's neighborhood, mm. China, Sri Lanka, oh, sorry, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Sri Nepal, Lanka, Bangladesh. Bhutan. But ev yeah. Yeah, all of these countries mm. have relationship with China. They're yeah. part of the Belt Road Initiative, something India exactly did not want. 
Yeah. So India sort of isolated itself in the problem because of its this premonition of glory first and not practically mm. looking at the problems mm. in, in the feet, you know. So you can't, you know, like it's a simple thing. If you don't have your house in order, you're not at peace at home. Mm. You're not in peace in your mohalla. Yeah. So how can you be in the city and, and the country, you know? So yeah. I'm just arguing that way. I'm not saying. Uh, by the way, there has been critique to this argument that I've made, but uh, that India has already risen, so that's not even a debate. It's okay. already been accepted mm -hmm. as a power. Yes, it is accepted, but I've analyzed that these two streams of thought are agreeing. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, India will be mired in its problems more. Mm -hmm. uh, but more importantly, the book, re I started the book at the time when Modi came to power and yes. I said, no, it's no longer that case now. The character and personality of India is now significantly yeah. changed. Yeah. So the domestic yeah. political, the, the innermost ring mm. is now becoming a very difficult, itself a bigger problem, mm. much less the periphery, you know. So that's a debate. Mm. And in assessing Pakistan grand strategy, I already mentioned as to yeah. where the problem lying is. So end of the day, India has, does not have a, a Pakistan policy and Pakistan, and Pakistan does not have a truly India policy in, India policy mm. in the end which is how we, we actually started the book. This is how Steve Cohen, the book is dedicated to him and because it was his idea. Yeah. So actually we framed the question from the very beginning in this sense that, okay, how do you think the South Asian conundrum is going to be resolved? Mm -hmm. So he said, well, uh, Pakistan had to accept the primacy of India. I mean, it is ordained to rise. I mean, you remember what stratagem you use, mm -hmm. uh, it's going to, uh, I mean, you're going to exhaust yourself trying mm. to compete with mm. such a resource gap. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, So yes, I mean, understood. So, mm. And then when I said, which is not what Western countries easily think about it. Mm. Mm. And then I said, for India has to accept that it is never going to get a subservient yeah. satellite, mm. Pakistan of sorts. Yeah. So if India is hoping that there is going to be a West Bangladesh of sorts, yeah. West yeah, Bangladesh. That, that is very interesting term. Of sort, that's yeah, never going yeah, to happen. Yeah, exactly. So, if, so how do we square this circle mm. for India to accept this and for Pakistan to accept mm. that? And this, mm. this is where the framework of the of the book was started, mm. and it was Steve Cohen. And the word West Bangladesh was used by Steve Cohen. I should give him the credit later. Yeah. I didn't. I was explaining that they, you can never have a subservient Pakistan. Yeah. So if you accept a, a sort of a Monroe Doctrine or Hegemonic India, Western countries <coughs> sort of said that we should have one capital to deal with in each region, which is mm. New Delhi. Mm. So we don't want to deal with the complexity of India, Pakistan. Uh, and so, you know, they, they got sort of exhausted mm. with mm. this. I said, well, it, you can't ignore that reality. Mm. Now that Pakistan and India both are nuclear power, it's going to be even more difficult uh, to, to, to get this kind of a model, a hegemonic model in the region, mm, yeah, uh, which many exactly. Western scholars think that, you know, stability can come with, with when hegemony becoming so dominant yeah. that the other yeah. one is, does not compete at all. Mm, mm. I say, no, no matter what happened, because it's going to rather collapse and dry, but it's not going exactly. to accept subservience. Yeah. And so actually, uh, like I said, the pause came because of weeding grass. So. Steve Cohen, who actually prompted the idea for me to continue to write, wrote himself his book called Shooting for the Century. Mm -hmm. So this book is kind of analogous or sort of, then I'm giving my way of thinking, okay. which yeah. is slightly yeah. different than Steve Cohen's way of thinking, but I can't match Steve Cohen as a doyen of South Asian thinking. Um, That's really humble my background. So <laughs> let's see what people have to say yeah. about what yeah. I've written. So coming to the next question. In your view, what is the most worrisome pattern between India and Pakistan? And um, this is but bit cheeky, but you got inspiration from uh, Clint Eastwood, the good, the bad, and ugly. What are the uh, most feared and best case scenarios or outcomes in s subcontinent? No, I usually do this, you know, this like very catchy title. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like my first one, Eating Grass, was a catchy title because, yeah. you know, it actually draws people's attention. Mm. Even mm. that book that, you know, wow, Eating Grass, many times people thought that this book would be on a shelf of Atkin or South Beach Diet. <laughs> w what does this really mean? Yeah. But then that was the thing that the, for marketing purposes and all, they said, wow, this is so mm. attractive as a preamble. And uh, I must tell you uh, that 
I was dissuaded by some people that why are you writing this because it's kind of giving impression that you're building bombs and just picking people in grass. Mm -hmm. I said, well, no, that's not what it is. It's the, it's it's the it's a very, I mean, that's make the uniqueness of yeah. Pakistan's yeah. program and that court is so famous mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. it was derived so. And this one, the good, the bad, and the ugly, could have been in the title, but I did not put that because that it's already there. Yeah, I mean Clint Eastwood because I live in Monterey, California, yeah, comment, so he's yeah. the, he was there, there, but that's not quite where it drew mm -hmm. from. Mm -hmm. It just uh, drew from the good, the bad, and the ugly because I think it's bad. It can, it's already bad. Yeah. So it can get ugly or it can get good. Mm -hmm. Again, those two pathways, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought that you know we're kind of lesser bad. So it could not be more bad hmm. in 2000 and that the only way of good and we have the structure to be on the good. Hmm. Hmm. So uh, that's what I could. So um, I did not want to finish the book uh, on ugly. Hmm. I wanted to finish on a more optimistic hmm. note. Hmm. So I initially tried to flip it by saying bad, ugly and good. good. <laughs> and so uh, many of the editorial people said that look it's you can do uh, Harry, Dick and Tom. It's always yeah, Tom, Dick and Harry. Yeah, so it's like a yeah. phrase. So you go yeah. with that flow. Yeah. So then it became the good, the bad and the ugly mm. from because that's just more mm. catchy in the mm. sense. Mm -hmm. But it also made a lot of sense that you know which bad is already understood in the pages. Yeah. So when yeah. you're talking about strategic mm. futures, mm. the good pathway and I continue to maintain because it, many people would say is a no-brainer that India, Pakistan have a history of CBMs, a history of negotiations, a process, and Lahore is still the master document, mm -hmm. maybe Islamabad Declaration 2004. Mm -hmm. By the way, um, Vajpayee comes as a sort of a hero in this book by mm -hmm. implication because he was the one who really took forward what Gujral and others could not. Yeah. That yeah. Gujral doctrine essentially uh, wanted to do with all of the neighbors of India except mm -hmm. Pakistan, try to cut off Pakistan. Mm -hmm. But Vajpayee was the one who picked up the real doctrine and said, no, mm -hmm. we can't do this. Yeah. So he consistently had hope coming to Lahore, then Agra, and then again back to Islamabad mm -hmm. before he lost. He never lost. And in between Kargil, in between parliament attack, Kandahar, see, everything happened that did not dissuade the leadership. So we must acknowledge mm -hmm. one leader in the same BJP. Mm -hmm. Look at what BJP today is in the same BJP then. So it is not that you are necessarily right wing that you are bad. Mm -hmm. It's I'm, I'm distinguishing yeah, that. Yeah, it's a yeah. peculiar cognitive way of thinking that makes it mm -hmm. more virulent. There's nothing wrong with being a Hindu, nothing mm -hmm. wrong probably. Mm -hmm. But when Hindutva gusts those poisonous, then there's yeah. a problem. It's not yeah. being a. So I'm, I'm also identifying that. So I'm saying that, you know, it makes more sense. And that's where I'm indicating that, which goes back to acquiescence, that India's strategy is to force Pakistan to acquiesce to India. Mm -hmm. rather than accommodate. There's a distinction between acquiescence, acquiescence and uh, accommodation. Yeah. And accommodation means it takes two to tango. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that's the pathway that you can come to a common denominator mm -hmm. of conflict resolution. And then all those things that you mentioned previously, connectivity, people to people contact, that should take its natural course. Mm -hmm. And that's going to diminish the security concerns without compromising on your principal position, you know, security will never go away in the region. Yeah. But it will yeah. not become what it is. And I'm sort of saying that uh, you should resurrect where, the, where you left in Lahore and you can now nuance it to the mm. 20th century mm. as a good pathway, uh, you know, and then I'm written down what it yeah, is yeah, yeah. in yeah. there. The, if that's not happened, the ugly one mm -hmm. can lead to everything that we have been fearing continuing and that yeah. gets into the, the the topic of escalation control assumptions mm -hmm. uh, in the in the region that you think that you can resolve a problem by force and then you keep on going on the escalation rather and get so ugly mm -hmm. and then in the process of really spite and continuing to asymmetrically keep on you yeah. know weakening the country or both yeah. each other yeah. in the end results in, 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 in collapse of the system and collapse mm -hmm. of the region and then all kind of worst thing can happen. I don't see that happening, and but you know you cannot rule out the ugly part. Exactly. Right? It can get ugly, so bad can get badder, if you will, mm. or closer to uglier. But uh, you know, uh, 
I don't see it that way, but I do mention in the book, and I was having discussion elsewhere also here, that India-Pakistan trajectory is, in, uh, the reason why I'm so optimistic about the good future is that if you see, you started with a mini short war in Kargil, hmm. then you started with a standoff for about 10 months, yeah. right? You're exactly. trying to so solve the problem by use of force. Force, yeah. yeah exactly. Then Mumbai happened, you paused. And then you did cold stars and tactical nuclear weapons came with their stalemate. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I, I, this is me saying this, uh, that eventually both cold start and tactical nuclear weapons kind of waned away. So they mm -hmm. did their job. And they brought yeah. to surgical strike, uh, yeah. quid pro quo plus. Yeah. You have Balakot that, you know, India is striking and not mm -hmm. striking to kill real people. And the Pakistan responding, not striking to kill mm -hmm. real people, avoiding military targets. So if you look at the trajectory, it was more violent, hmm. and it's a less violent. It is hmm. a inbuilt restraint that both countries are showing without having a structural restraint agreement between the hmm. two countries. So that shows some signs of pathways towards a good future in the region. Hmm. Even when we talk about what can go awfully wrong is by way of analysis, but not by way of empirical observation. Hmm. So when I look at the empirical observation that violence and things are getting more and more, and what has enabled them to do so, because th they don't admit it, but there's a recognition that those, that, those stratagems, mm -hmm. cold start and tactical yeah, weapons, yeah. have greater downsides, yeah. outcome, that there's not an end to it. What text, what text? You don't know what text is, mm -hmm. except that it goes through the nuclear exchange and destruction of the subcontinent. If you yeah, continue, yeah, exactly. it doesn't end. Yeah. So then, they realizing that the cost of all the stratagem and wars is mm. so greater, you nuance your thinking by getting into surgical strikes. Mm. Yeah. You know, yeah. General Kidwai said that in IISS conference, by the way, where is Cold Star Doctrine? You know, he said that in the speech because it's all recorded. Mm -hmm. His observation is somewhat right because nobody's going to admit that, oh, it's all over. Mm. Nobody's going to admit that tactical weapon is not. But I think there is a realization that it has done its job. The mm. purpose for it. Mm. So you have surgical strat strategy which does not involve greater force and all. Mm. But what it does, it ironically, it's paradoxical that it makes the decision maker easier to decide to go there. Mm. Why that has enabled not just a cost, the technological evolution, True. the maturation of technology mm. of this age has exactly. enabled uh, exactly. them to come out. So you can get precision guided munitions. You can mutually use the uh, unmanned vehicles, yeah, and yeah, so this yeah. information and technological revolution of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting into AI and autonomous, but yes, it eventually look at the pathway. That is increasing precision strikes, etc., mm -hmm. which is a very different ca change character of warfare in, in the direction that we are moving now. Exactly, and that has enabled less <laughs> violence. So, uh, in the sense, so. We're not seeing a catastrophic future because technology is ironically helping, paradoxically helping region to stabilize in some sense, whereas it can easily be destabilizing if it is abused, mm. you know, in a different way. So here is a very different thing that the more easier it becomes for decision making to allow, it's easy for a prime minister of India or Pakistan to say, all right, I authorize 10 UAVs to do and do this, yeah. as opposed to a squadron of aircraft. Yeah. For India to say Rafale to attack yeah. because Abhinandan was dropped hmm. rather than saying a UAV is to that. You yeah. know, so these standoff weapon systems will are allowing more precision. So you're not going to use nuclear warheads, you will probably be using more precision conventional warheads to, to sort of make the point. Hmm. Yeah. So you're hurting each other, yeah. not trying to resolve the problem. Hmm. So, so I, I see that the, I'm a purely observation at how they see it, that it's lessening. So it reinforces that if you structure, make it a structural agreement, mm -hmm. these good trends that have been demonstrated, take the case of Brahmos in India and Pakistan. You exactly. even try, in the end, what happened? Mm. Nothing happened. Yeah, yeah. You know, India said, I'm sorry. Pakistan said, you are, I don't accept. But then you, you know, kind of, OK, yeah. we yeah. know it. Yeah. But then you'd keep on saying, oh, no, no, you wanting to test our defenses. Others mm. say, no, it was accidental. Mm. In India, they said, no, no, we, it was accidental. Mm. Pakistan will always think about it. In India, will always say, oh, Pakistani, half of them will say, no, they deliberately did not target military. And, mm. and Balakot, after that, 
Others would say, oh, no, no, their systems are so stupid that they miss the yeah, target. Yeah. This thing will go on. This is, after all, South Asia. You know, yeah. the, Both sides will keep on saying this. Yeah. But cumulatively, as you look, look, as I see, I don't see a terrible future in South Asia uh, because of the trend that I just explained. Yeah. So I, I wanted to finish on the good face, and I think I, you finished more, on I, I do face. finish yeah. on more optimistic yeah. uh, future yeah. because yeah. I come back to the same point where I began yeah. this book yeah. by saying that a cautiously optimistic future is there despite whatever is happening inside India and despite the crisis that Pakistan yeah. is in there. There is, a, there is a silver lining ahead that I can yeah, see. Yeah. And I must say that this region needs that optimism. Yeah. Yeah? yeah. yeah. So time has brought us to last question. So there's a, a lot of literature on India and Pakistan, on conflicts and on the whole on this region. So being the author of this book, uh, Subcontinent Adrift, what is the unique perspective that you think this uh, book has brought that was missing previously? So, I think I'm glad you asked this question. In the last 20 years, if you look books books coming out in Western press, particularly the US, mm -hmm. it's separate about India, Rising India, Great India, This India, That India, yeah, yeah, yeah. India's Grand Strategy, Non-Grand Strategy, all mm -hmm. separately. What about book about Pakistan? You know, mo between mosque and this and like Pakistan, drift to extremism, mm. bleeding, exploding Pakistan, warrior state. Yeah. Look at the trend there. No book brought together the two together. Very few mm. books, maybe. Yeah. yeah. As to what does this mean? By if India is doing this, what does it mean to Pakistan? If Pakistan does this, what does this mean? So this book puts together the two and say this is the dialectic of the two and this is the consequence yeah. of that. Yeah. Which I'm I'm claiming it. I'm hoping it because that's why the book was accepted by the publishers that wow you do you think why is it so different that's the first thing any publisher was asked you mm -hmm. know why is it so different and i said well this is different because look at this book and look at this book and i'm putting it together they said yes you get it right mm -hmm. now mm -hmm. so uh, and that's what and you know you begin thinking but then it takes a different course and there are reviews i must say something for the pakistani audience particularly here that it's very hard Mm. for a Pakistani origin person to publish the book in, you know, in, in Western press now. Yeah. Given all the negative press about mm. the country yeah, that yeah, has yeah. existed yeah. in 20 and many of our uh, fellow Pakistani authors have written the same thing to reinforce that belief. It's tough to challenge their belief which is existing and so you get very lot of pushback on the review process. Mm. So I had a lot of pushback both in eating grass as well as that because it's very hard for Pakistan narrative to stick, you know. Mm. And therefore there's pushback in addressing that. The book comes out more, uh, there is no way you can survive for a person like me uh, to to write a book with, with subjectivity. I have to be very objective. Yeah. And my yeah. best way to say, this is what India says, this is what Pakistan says, and this is what I think is the way. You know, Sometimes India is right, sometimes Pakistan, Pakistan is right. So who's right in my view? And that's the way you think. And then you leave it to the author sometimes. I don't know who's right. Mm. You decide. I don't decide, you know. I don't want yeah. to be condescending to decide for you. And I think the, the scholarly convention in the Western world that I have now grown because post-military life, that's the only thing that I know. I'm not familiar what is happening here because I've never published in Pakistan. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know here. Mm. Unless I do that, what's the peer review process, how the system is done, what scholarly conventions are expected, I don't know that here. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's all my, it's, it's a very humble effort. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm waiting for really appraisals and, and critical review here as the book comes to, to the region. Yeah. That's great, that's great. Thank you so much, sir. Mm -hmm. Time is a limitation, but this discussion was so important. Yeah. and intense. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much Thank you for so taking much. out. Thank you so much. I'm very grateful you did that and I'm so happy to be back in Pakistan and you know, sad moment. It's a flood moment in the yeah. country. It has subsided. Yeah. Uh, I can tell from all behalf of all diaspora in America that they are all very concerned and mm -hmm. ready to help yeah. big time. You know. Yeah. I also want to thank our audience for watching this. I hope you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed it. Thank you. Goodbye.